Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Behind the Servants. So, I get asked fairly often if I will ever do a Behind the Servants on the Foreigner class in FGO. Kind of like what I've done for the Alters and Alter Egos in the past. The thing is though is that I've already done that in the Behind the Servants Halloween special, but given that not many people have watched that video and that the tone in it is more roundabout, I figured I'd just make a more dedicated video on the topic just focusing on that out of this world class. So, without further ado, let's go into the world of madness, insanity, and Kuroboshi art that is the foreigners. So let's start with an explanation of what the Foreigner class actually is. It is made up of existences that originate outside of the realm of humanity with some exceptions. The big tying factor for this class is space. Every single Foreigner servant either has its origins in space or is directly related to the exploration of space. Normally, the Foreigner class is unable to engrave itself upon the throne of heroes, because they don't have any ties to humanity themselves, and thus don't qualify as potential defenders of it. Again, there is one exception. This is something that is worth keeping in mind, because servant vs. servants aren't actually summoned so much as that they're just kinda hanging out at Caldea, unless of course I'm completely misunderstanding how they interact, but then again, servant versus servant verse. Which brings us to the classifications that the Foreigners all fall under. Old Gods and Aliens, Servant vs. Servants, and Voyager. Old gods and aliens are the most abundant of the foreigners and primarily consist of Lovecraftian deities. The Servant Verse is the true cosmic horror of the fake canon, and if you want a more in-depth analysis of that, there's a dedicated video to it linked here. For this video, I'm going to roll with the assumption that you've either watched that video or already know what the Servant Verse is and what it's all about, which is a lie because no one actually does. The third classification is just that little lost child himself, Voyager, whose origins are on Earth but managed to shift into a servant at some point. For this video, I'll give a brief introduction into how these servants are able to manifest as a foreigner class, and if they fall under the first category, I'll give a bit of who is inhabiting them and the host vessel themselves and see if there's a connecting line there. Alright, that's enough of the prologue, let's talk foreigners. The first thing to note is that all foreigners share a class-specific skill called Existence Outside the Domain. This skill is given to servants summoned from somewhere that is not the Earth. The level of the skill is supposed to correspond to the influence in which the aforementioned existence has over the vessel it inhabits, or just how powerful that existence is. It could also just be how much of what is manifested is originally from space. Things like Outer Gods that are infinitely powerful like yogg Sothoth and Cthulhu are going to have it at a higher rank than others like Voyager whose origins are on the Earth. Other classes do have this skill based on how they've been influenced by the Outer Void, such as Summer Beebe who had a connection with an outer god, but due to her own prowesses was not controlled by them. Then there's Okita J. Soji, whose swimsuit is technically made from servant vs. tech, so she sits at the lowest ranking of the skill. As mentioned, the first category is made up of servants that have been possessed by an outer god or are non-servant vs. aliens. This includes Abigail Williams, Hokusai, Yang Fei, Vincent Van Gogh, Jacques de Molay, and Koyanskaya of Dark. On a technicality, Summer BB fits this explanation as well, but given that she is a moon cancer, I've chosen to leave her out. Given that gods are unable to directly muddle or manifest into the world of humans under normal circumstances, they have to find other ways to come down to Earth. This is done by attaching themselves onto the spirit origins of servants who are viewed as compatible. It works almost identical to pseudo-servants, except with an extra tinge of madness. We do, though, get some insight with certain servants like Yang as to how they got picked. There is another way to bring an old god to earth, and that is through incantations and archaic rituals done by members of that deity's cult. Through sacrifice and a proper catalyst, much like how servants are summoned in fate, a portal to the realm of a deity can be opened, allowing them access to our world. As far as I know, this has yet to happen for any of the servants that we summoned, but I believe that there's indications that Jacques de Molay's Knights Templar may have accidentally invoked the old god Shavnigaroth during a ritual which is further implied by her noble phantasm, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's begin with Fate's first voyager on my level 100, Abigail Williams. Abby actually has two foreigner forms, both still have her possessed by the same old one Yog sothoth in the tales of H.P. Lovecraft, Yogg is something of an interesting god because he is not one that is inherently evil. He exists as the guard, gate, and key to the realm of infinite knowledge. He will assist you in getting you what you want, but he will also not warn or prevent you from going and seeing horrors that will warp your mind and break your body, or worse. He is omniscient and knows all things, but is locked outside of the universe, unable to actually interact with those inside of it. He himself is often described as a massive glowing orbs, but the description of him being the key, the gate, and the gatekeeper is where Abby's the design in the fate seems to originate from. Plainly speaking, the great deal of key imagery in her second and third ascension forms, and technically both of her noble phantasms being what lies beyond the gate. Yogg is perhaps best known for his role in the Dunwich Horror, which is also where we get Lavinia Waitley from. In this story, Yogg impregnates Lavinia with twins after the deity was summoned or conjured by her father. This adds a whole other dimension to the Lavinia and Abby relationship, making Rio's art unfortunately historically accurate. Lavinia then gives birth to twins, the grotesquely monstrous Wilbur Waitley and the ever-growing invisible sibling that is the Dunwich Horror. 
This story goes to show an extent of the Old One's power over humans, being able to use them to create vile inhuman beings while hardly even needing to manifest. The reason why the Chosen Vessel was Abigail Wheeling from the Salem Witch Trial is largely unknown to me. It seems more like a convenient set piece for the story more than requiring any actual reasoning, but examining what goes on in Salem is fascinating from a Lovecraftian standpoint. For one, her guardian is Randolph Carter, a recurring character in Lovecraft stories appearing to take the guise of someone who appears similar to Lovecraft himself. This appearance in and of itself is noteworthy, and I reckon the fact that we are and I reckon that the fact that they were connected in the story is the sole reason why Abby's summer form is about one of Carter's stories, that being the dreamlands of unknown Cadith. Tied into a nice little package, Carter is part of a series of stories such as The Silver Key and Through the Gate of the Silver Key, in which he encounters Yogg Sothoth once passing through the ultimate gate. This gate very well could have also been Yogg, so the existence of the Silver Key as Abby's Bond CE now has a real world basis. For being the first foreigner in FGO, it's nice to see that they put a significant amount of thought into how this would work. That said, the choice of Abigail Williams technically aged down from when she appeared in the story is still a bit of a mystery. That's fine though because she's cute. Our next entry is perhaps the most Giga Chat tale we have of one of these deities. Katsushika Hokusai was perhaps the most well-known artist in Japanese history and as such has the notoriety to be someone as a servant. He was known as the old man mad about art, implying that he was a crazy artist. Now, this connection with insanity could be the connecting factor that allowed an old god to merge with him, or at least attempt to, but to my knowledge it's not explicitly said. What we do know is that the old god possessing Hokusai is that of the high priest of Relay and dreamer in the deep Cthulhu. We are told that Cthulhu wanted to try and manifest by taking over the spirit origin of Hokusai, but Hokusai believed that Cthulhu's sense of artistic taste was so awful that he outright refused to let it happen. Thus, a mental power struggle occurred, with Hokusai winning out in the end with the assistance of his daughter, Oi. The reason why we were able to summon Oi is because of the close bond that the two shared in life, which is something that we have seen in other sermons as well, such as Anne and Mary, Orion, and the Dioscuri. This fighting did not fully remove the old god's presence, though, and it did manage to merge partially with Hokusai. Hence, why we summon them, we get an octopus in the package. This octopus is Hokusai himself, with no other mal aside from the tacofication. It is also implied that Hokusai is the main personality in the third ascension form, which is the more corrupted one given the blood red sea and the fishermen in the background. This third ascension, much like many of the Kuroboshi third ascensions, is the one that is mostly inspired by the Lovecraftian style, yet still shows signs that Hokusai is the one who is in full control. Explaining who Cthulhu is is somewhat of a moot point because he more or less is the mascot of cosmic horror at this point, but his origins and stories are worth sharing anyway. He is the octopus-faced priest with dragonic wings and a human body who lays dreaming and trapped inside the city of Relais, until the day it eventually resurfaces. It is unclear when exactly this may happen, but members of his cult are attempting to hasten the process. Despite being only able to dream, however, Cthulhu himself is able to manipulate people to his will through what is either brainwashing or straight-up mental breaks at people. His influence is also what leads to his creation of fish people who serve him blindly. The best examples of this are in The Shadow Over Innsmouth, Dagon, and of course, The Call of Cthulhu. The Shadow Over Innsmouth is the tale of a man investigating a recent raid on a town reported to be caused by prohibition, but the narrator believed it to have a deeper meaning. Well, it turns out that he was right, and he uncovers that the town has become subservient to a cult of fish people called the Deep Ones, who breed with the populace and make more of themselves, and the raid was actually them retaliating after being denied human sacrifices. These Deep Ones are a direct byproduct of Cthulhu's corruption, and view him as an all-powerful god. We get the actual description of the creature from the tale, The Call of Cthulhu, where a ship captain and his crew release the creatures into the ocean, describing it as a head like a bulbous cuttlefish and a draconoid body with scaly wings. This story also puts forth the claim that Cthulhu himself is now loose back into the world, no longer shackled to the city, having a group of random sailors fulfill the failed desires of an ancient cult. This tale also boasts the regenerative abilities of the beast, having its head split open by the sailor's ship, only for it to immediately begin reforming. Reminder, in Fate Canon, a crazy old man managed to hold him back. But that is the long and the short of this one. Unfortunately, Hokusai hasn't had any mainline story action yet, so our knowledge of them as a character is limited to the off-event and interludes. And Summer 4 didn't help to enlighten any of this. Next up we have Yang Guifei, one of China's four greatest beauties. Her legend is one built in tragedy, being a victim of her own beauty and driving her emperor to do anything that she desired, and, and even when she desired not, he still continued to give. At the moment after her death, her soul was viewed by a distant god, a planetoid creature that spewed hellish heat like a malignant sun. This was the deity Katuga. Drawn in by her immaculate beauty, this being merged with Yang's spirit origin. As for Katuga itself, unfortunately we don't really know much about this deity as it is. It appears merely in mentions of stories, and as far as I am aware, doesn't appear as a main antagonist in any Lovecraftian stories. 
and I have read all of them. That is because this one is not a Lovecraft original. It appears in the story The House on Kerwin Street by author August Derelith. What we know about this creature is that it is a massive ball of fire served by flaming creatures as his servants, and believed to be the progenitor of flaming vampires. So a bit of fun lore then with Yang is that this act of being served constantly and always being something to be doted on is likely the direct connection between the two, and we even see these maid servants in Yang's animations appearing as the flying servants of Katugua. Okay, let's now talk about what is perhaps the most genius foreigner from a design and lore perspective, and one that I didn't realize went as deep as it did in the design at all until doing research for this video. The soul of Van Gogh is possessed by not one, but two separate spirits. The first, and reason why she qualifies as a foreigner in the first place, is the plant god from Mars, Volthum. Appearing in Clark Ashton Smith's story Volthum, we are told that the being itself is something akin to Satan, but an alien, landing on Mars and causing a civil war among its inhabitants. While it is unsuccessful in this endeavor, it is still alive and desires to corrupt Earth and take it as a trophy. This meddling is likely where it wound up interacting with Van Gogh. The deity, though not an actual deity, just a really strong alien, is described as a plant-like creature with a beautiful elfin body. As a being, it is largely mysterious and doesn't have much in the way of its own stories, but it is able to produce a hallucinogenic powder that can corrupt those who it inhales. Van Gogh is, of course, the famous Dutch painter responsible for the pieces Starry Night, Vase with 15 Sunflowers, and Vincent Van Gogh. Most famous post-death for the pains of his life, and now viewed as a master of art with an incredibly distinct style, his addition to this game was one that is far from surprising. In reality, we don't actually have Van Gogh, though. We instead have Clytie, an Oceanid that has merged with the memories of Van Gogh and has been corrupted by Volthum. Clytie was an Oceanid, making her a direct relative to Chiron and the other Greek gods. She appears in Ovid's tale as a lover of the sun god Helios. However, after he was cursed by Aphrodite, he fell deeply in love with a mortal princess. This left Clytie in a bit of a predicament because Ovid makes it very clear that Helios loved her much stronger than he loved the others, so she retaliated. She told the princess's father of the relationship, and he had her killed for being defiled. However, Helios did not return to Clytie, but instead avoided her completely. Her plan had backfired, and she decided to wait for Helios to return for nine days without food or water. By the end of the ordeal, she had turned into a heliotrope flower. Flowers that are heliotropes, or heliotropic, follow the sun in the sky. Now, I ask you, dear listener, what famous flower is heliotropic? The sunflower. Even on days when the sun is not visible in the sky, sunflowers are able to track its movements with precision. This design choice then to merge Clytie and Van Gogh was not just a random, eh, whatever, kind of decision. This was one that was completely thought through and the addition of Volthum as a plant god only adds more to it. So, there you go. A character that on release was perhaps the most confusing gender bent actually turns out to be one of the most well-considered characters in the entire game from a design perspective. And then we're on the other end of that spectrum with Jacques de Molay. De Molay was the 23rd and final Grand Master of the Knights Templar after the organization had fallen into a desecrated version of itself. While we do have a saber form of theirs that is a male in FGO Arcade, the version we summon as a foreigner in FGO Mobile is a gender bend. This is directly blamed on the corruption of the primordial fertility goddess of the Lovecraft universe, Shub Nagurath. The reason for this possession is because of the debaucherous nature of the Knights Templar near the end of their existence and the main accusation of them telling new recruits that it was not only permissible but encouraged to go forth with acts of sexual desire and to not suppress these feelings. Using this corruption of morals towards the extremely debaucherous Shub likely came into the corruption of Damalay. Oddly enough, the Damalay we summon acts differently than the one in Arcade, seeming to not have only adjusted but fully taken on the new persona. But let's talk about the god itself. Shub is, as mentioned prior, a goddess of fertility, given the additional name of the Black Goat of the Woods who bore 1,000 young. She is in a constant state of creating new horrendous life that oftentimes is immediately absorbed right back into her massive body. Technically a Lovecraft original, first appearing in one of his main works in his story The Last Test, we still know very little about her. We know that she is the likely mother of many of the Lovecraftian pantheon, and is something of a wife to Yog sothoth throwing another weird-ass connection to Abby. She is hypothesized to be the most wise widely worshipped of the Old Ones, and her name appears in chants in the Necronomicon fairly often. She is another entity that is not expressly evil, though does create life that has a tendency to be. You see, the issue with examining things that are beyond comprehension is that attempting to comprehend them is difficult. Alright, spoilers for the JP story up to Tunguska, our final non-servant vs. alien foreigner is Koyonskaya of Dark. So. This one is kind of complicated as the information isn't really fully out there in English yet, so I'm going to have some holes in this description so just bear with me. Here's what we know. 
She originates from a section of the universe that is different from ours, but also different from the one that the Lovecraftian foreigners come from. It's a mysterious plane that we are not informed enough about to actually have put forth a good explanation on, but it could be from around the same area that the alien god we are combating is from. She came to Earth on a meteor that is known as the Tunguska event. This is a real life occurrence over Siberia in which a meteor streaked across the sky and exploded in the atmosphere, leveling the tree lines and creating a marvel of a scene. She would then be cared for by a Russian heroic spirit named Dobrynya Nikitich, or more specifically, his wife and his spirit origin. I'll save the rest for when that story actually comes to NA in a year or so, but this is perhaps the most troubling of all the foreigners. Her existence comes with the direct implication that hostile and powerful alien life exists in the far corners of the universe, and that we are going to have to potentially combat it in the near future. Oh wait, that's already the plot of the Lost Belts. But where this gets to become concerning is where Koyanskaya has the makings of a beast of humanity. Then again, the Greek gods are also spacefaring robots from a distant corner of the universe as well, so sky's the limit, whatever. Alright, let's now look at the foreigners directly related to the servant verse. For those of you that don't know what the servant verse is, good. If you have any interest in learning what it is, please refer to the video at the top right corner, because I still haven't farmed enough insight to properly view it again. These servants are Mysterious Heroine XX and Mysterious Idol X Alter. They are both foreigners for the same reason, so I'll explain that now. They are inhabitants of the Sapphire Galaxy, which is an alternate universe thing that is also kind of in our universe, but not really. I mean, you can technically fly to it if you move at warp speed or something. The whole deal with the servant verse is that it's a galaxy or universe inhabited by servants. Mind you, these are not like our servants who were famous and accomplished warriors. They just happen to look the same and have similar power levels to them, if not greater ones. Mysterious Heroine X, or MHXX as I will call her, originates from this place. She gained the classification of foreigner through her skill protection at universe end which allowed her to reach the farthest ends of the universe itself. She works for the Galactic Police Force with the express job of dealing with foreigners. Hence, why in her first appearance in Summer 3, she actively kills Hokusai if we don't stop her from doing so in the time loop. Speaking of, it can also be reasoned that her ability to warp space-time in order to get dressed faster is a skill on par with that of an ancient one that is really something else when you think about it. Unlike the old gods, I really don't have much to pull from here aside from how she just appears in the story, and in that she just kind of appears as 100% comic relief. Debatably top 5 FAs in the entire game though, so there's that. Mysterious Heroine X Alter Idol, or MHXAI, is what happens when idol culture in Japan had an enormous spike due to the popularity of Hololive. Her reasoning for switching to the foreigner class has to do with her change in costume. Much like Okita J, the costume she wears has its origins in the servant verse, where she is originally from. So, the reconnection there to become a foreigner makes a fair bit of sense to all things considered. Honestly, when it comes to characters in the servant verse, I think it's fair to say that you can more or less just show up as whatever you want, and the in universe explanation will be something like, well, you know, that's just how it is sometimes. And you just have to accept it because that's how it works. Our final foreigner and classification fits nicely into his own little category of outlier Voyager. His real class on Fate Requiem shares the same name as him, Voyager, but as that would mean hiring someone to make new card art, they decided to make him a foreigner instead as they're pretty close anyway. Rather than being an alien coming to Earth, he is our gift to the universe. I mean, look at him, he's clearly a gift. As he achieved the status as a servant after being the first object from Earth to enter deep space, his having the skill existence outside of the domain likely originates from that. The other potential reasoning from this has to do with where his design originates from. It is not uncommon knowledge that he is heavily based off of the character The Little Prince from the novel sharing the same name. The character of The Little Prince is an alien who lives on a planet where he dotes on his rose. It's a good story, go read it, but this connection could be part and partial as to why he has the skill. There really isn't much to say in him in regards to his class, other than I hope that his inclusion into Fate opens the doors for future servants like him, like Lake of the Space Dog for Grand Berserker. Real quick, there is a one Lovecraftian deity that we have not quite received just yet, but I predict that we will see them in the next two years. That is, the King in Yellow himself, Haster. He appears as a mysterious creature, clothed in what else but yellow and wearing a mask. I could honestly see them adding the character Baldwin IV of Jerusalem, who was better known as the Leper King and also the inspiration for the character the Leper in Darkest Dungeon. But that is it. That is the Foreigners in the Bank. Thank you all so much for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Let me know what you thought down in the comments. If there is a topic you would like me to cover, please let me know down there. Hey, let me know what you think about the new look. Do all the YouTube stuff, you know what they are by this point. Check the links down in the description below for my shop, the Discord, and my Twitter. Also check out the Twitch, but for now, keep your chin up, peace.